Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important work of advocating for abused and neglected children and youth in foster care, and particularly in Contra Costa County, with our special guest, Ann Rickson, Executive Director of the CASA of, of Contra Costa County. And it's great to have you here. I'm so looking forward to having this conversation. And and also, thank you so much for spending time this morning with us. Oh, well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So let's let's start off, Anne, with giving everyone an orientation on the important role of, of a CASA, court, a, a court-appointed uh, uh, special advocate. Okay. Uh, is that correct? Court, court-appointed? Yeah. That's exactly right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I sometimes get get mixed up with the app. So let's, <laughs> let's do that again. So, Anne, let's start off by talking about what a court-appointed special advocate is, a CASA is, and the important role that, that a CASA plays in the, in the lives of children. Okay. Well, CASA volunteers are essentially the voice for the child in dependency court, which is a court, but none of these children have done anything wrong. Something wrong has been done to them. They've been abused or neglected. But often um, the child's wishes or needs kind of get overlooked in the whole process. So we train volunteers to provide that voice to young people, children and uh, young people in the court system. One of the important things is is understanding what has transpired before the moment that a child is in court. And um, if you take a look at the panoply of different conditions that a child can have lived through and the ages and the different uh, places that a child can come from, you have a very complicated network. The, the abuse or neglect can be extremely subtle or totally obvious, right? It could happen when a child is very young, a baby. It can happen when a child is a youth and and almost ready for independence. It can happen to a black child or a white child or a Latin Hispanic child or an Asian child. It can happen to a child who is same sex oriented or opposite sex oriented. It could happen to the best looking child in the family or a child who um, uh, uh, has some sort of a condition and, cre- and there's resentment within the family. Could you talk a little bit about how you come to that child? Because you're coming to the child without necessarily much more than a little bit of paperwork, and now you have to get to know the child. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, that's actually a really good point because it can be a little bit difficult Needless to say, abuse or neglect doesn't make people very trusting of others. And then the foster care system um, further makes that a problem because they are often have many, many adults working with the child. Right. Numerous social workers, attorneys. So the children are used to people coming in and out of their lives. On top of that, they're being moved from foster home to foster home. So when you bring somebody new into their lives, they often don't trust them. They may not be interested in talking to them. So I think the most important thing that CASA volunteers do is they stay consistently involved. They keep showing up no matter what. If the child moves from home to home, they're there. And then over time, what ends up happening is they're often the only adult who knows the entire the child's entire story while they're in foster care. Because if they've been moved, on average, children are moved eight times in foster care to different homes. So therefore, you know, they might who knows what's going on except the CASA volunteer. Now, one of the things that I always have felt is, is broken about our system surrounding children is that we we have an industrial type of assembly line uh, for kids and the foster care uh, stations, you know, the eight the eight times that, a, that an average child moves, um, they, they function almost like it's an assembly line. The courts function almost like an assembly line. The caseworkers function a little bit like an assembly line. 
we don't gather around a child and assure consistency from the very beginning. Um, we we try, but even a caseworker who will theoretically follow that child, you know, people's careers changes, staff changes, uh, cities change, and so on. And it's 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 very very dysfunctional from the child's perspective. How do we change that? You know, I don't know how we change it. I wish I did. But the, I mean, you're right. The, what the children need is consistency and they need love. They need to feel like people care about them. Now, one of the important things about CASA volunteers is they're not paid. And the children know that. They know that the CASA volunteer is the only adult in their life who is not paid to take care of them. And that actually means a lot. And I can understand why. because. It basically just comes down to a child needs to be in a stable home for a long period of time for the, you know, their entire time in foster care, and they need people who love them. Now, of course, you can't make people love somebody, right. but a volunteer is very likely to love you because why would they keep coming back if they didn't? They don't have any other motivation. So um, could you talk a little bit about the age range where people are are coming into the CASA system um, from from the youngest to the oldest? And where where, where is the uh, top of the bell curve? In other words, where do most people come into? Well, most of the youth that we serve end up being in from the age of about, I don't know, eight to 16. However, having said that, that's not who's mostly in the system. Half of the people of the uh, children in the system are under the age of five. Right. And you can stay in foster care in California until you're 21. So there's a wide range of who's in the system. And we serve anybody who comes into the system. So I mean, if I get a cost yeah, of volunteer, what kind of what kind of training do I get? What kind of what? Training do I get? If I come in and I'm, I'm interested in volunteering as a CASA volunteer, what kind of training do you provide? Because you know, we'll training provide you, for, first of all, of course, you have to go through an extensive background check. Right. After that, we'll train you in child development, in how trauma impacts child development, and how to work not, to work with children who have been traumatized. There's also a whole other section because you have to also interact with the court so we train you how to write court reports and what support we can provide you with we are also very very focused on ensuring that our kids are getting educated that they graduate from high school that they learn to read um so often our volunteers hold the educational rights for the children and we'll get them eat um, if they need it eat, um, ieps individual education plans so that they're getting the supports they need in the schools. You know, I also really want to point out something really important about this, because I often feel like what happens with foster care is that it gets, oh, that's child welfare, we'll deal with that. But the reality is this impacts all of us in our community. I mean, we know that at least 50% of the homeless in our community are former foster youth. 33% of the people in our jails our former foster youth, and more than 50% of the prison population in California are former foster youth. So clearly, this isn't just an issue that just impacts these kids, and then, you know, they go up and everything's fine. No. I mean, and I just sort of feel like if we could, you know, be, fix things further upstream, we'd be able to handle some of these other issues that are going on. Well, also, uh, foster care disrupts educational progress, right? So what ends oh, up yes. happening is that um, is that the average foster child, uh, and there are exceptions, but the average foster ch uh, child um, has a, a lesser level of educational attainment for their uh, age because they've suffered so much disruption and, and so much uh, has interfered with that process of learning. That requires, yes. a, you know, equanimity and stability. Yeah, that's that's very, very problematic. Um, I mean, nationwide, about 52% of foster youth never graduate from high school. 
obviously that's not going to set you on a course to thrive as an adult. In Kanakat County, it's actually pretty good at 70%. Mm -hmm. It's still not as high as non-foster youth, which is at 80 to 90, 88 to 90% who graduate from high school, but it's much better. And those who have a CASA volunteer, they all graduate from high school or earn a GED. You know, one of the other things I really wanted to point out about foster care that's really problematic is it's very, who's in foster care is completely disproportionate to the population. Now, overall in foster care, uh, the most, the largest number of children are white. However, that's just because there are a large number of the population. Right. But like in Contra Costa County, 49% of the children in care are African-American, but they're only 9% of the population. So that doesn't make any sense. It's, and I, I've always really believed that it's strongly tied to poverty and that if we provided supports to those families, we would have many less children in foster care. But there's well, not okay. something else going on here to have so many um, children of color in our system when there's such a small percentage of the population. I also think that that the way to heal that um, is 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 really uh, interesting because uh, the, it, it begs the question: if there are so many uh, kids in foster care um, in a particular group, what are the symptoms? If that's a symptom, what is the cause? Right? What is the cause of that? Is it poverty in your mind? Is it uh, an issue of transgenerational? Uh, trauma that has been suffered by certain uh, groups? Well, I think it's both. I think, it, I mean, of course, there's transgenerational poverty in our African-American community, given that, although slavery seems like a long time ago, it really wasn't. And also, um, you know, even after say, slavery, there was Jim Crow, there were all sorts of other discriminations that continues to be. So, of course, there's going to be transgenerational uh, trauma. And there's also poverty. And we know that African-Americans in the United States have 1% of the wealth of our nation, which is astonishing that that could happen. So, you know, what we need to do is provide support to these families. Poverty puts families under so much stress. And often when families are poor, it can look like they're neglecting their children when really they're not. They just don't have the resources to provide things that the family needs. And I do think our county actually is moving in the right direction. They, um, Families First legislation that was recently passed, they have opted in and they are working to provide prevention before removing children. And in fact, it's been really successful so far. Um, it went over a couple of years from 1,200 children in foster care to 600. Um, let's talk a little bit about what the Family First legislation actually does mm -hmm. and how it, it manifests in Contra Costa. So talk yeah. a little bit about what Family First is about. Yeah, well, Families First is uh, federal legislation that provides money to local communities if they decide to implement a plan of prevention for child abuse and neglect. And you have to develop a plan, which then has to be um, okayed by the state, which Contra Costa County has done. And then, you know, start implementing this. And there's extra money that will come from the federal government to help implement these plans. And in Contra Costa County, you know, they already had started trying to implement some of the plans even before they wrote this up. And I do think that these is the right direction to go in, to providing support for these families so that the children are not removed. So the Family First Preventive Services Act, which is the California version of this, yes, is uh, shaped to help children and youth remain at home with their okay. families, right? And to help the families um, avoid dissolution and entry of children into the foster care system which is traumatic for the children and also quite traumatic for the family itself. Right. So it provides before the time of, of crisis, it provides support. 
And it's simply like trying to lower your cholesterol before you have a heart attack or exercising before you have a heart attack to try and strengthen the immune system. It just happens to have a different manifestation. And what you're saying is that by uh, trying to provide this type of therapy, this type of preventive services, we're actually going to avoid the downstream costs, both monetary and and societal, of having so many kids in foster care and taken away from their families. Right, exactly. And, you know, one of the things I want to point out that, well, this is my own personal uh, view on these things, is um, although sometimes I think that things like uh, parenting classes, rehab is often very um, important for some of these families who are struggling with addiction. But in general, you need to have in-home services because what we would make families do is go to all of these classes and services all over the county, which, by the way, Contra Costa County does not have good public transit. And they often, you know, then they'd have and they couldn't get off from work if they were working. Well, I mean, to set up more barriers, it wasn't like it was almost impossible to be able to do all these things that the state was requiring to get your children back. So I do think that it's very important that we we have services like that, that a lot of them be in home services so that they don't have to travel. It's right. the social workers or other people are traveling to them to provide them with the services that they need. I also think it's more beneficial for things to be done um, in your home because then, you know, you're there and people can see what's going on. I know a lot of people don't like having strangers in their homes and so forth, but I think it would be more effective in helping families. Let me ask you another question. In the foster care system, there is a larger uh, prevalence of uh, people who identify as members of the LGBTQ plus community, mm -hmm. um, often because of, of uh, family rejection of, of that identity. Um, and you have uh, abuse and neglect that, that comes as a consequence of, of societal shame. How do you deal with that kind of a situation so that your CASAs have an understanding, not only of the lived experience of somebody who might have, be of a different ethnicity, race, uh, or religion than they are, but also of a different identity? Yeah, no, we provide intensive training on um, working with LGBTQ plus youth so that... Um, you know, our volunteers are prepared to work with those youth. Many of our volunteers are from that community. And as much as possible, we try to match um, LGBT um, volunteers with LGBT youth. So you're trying basically to find the right match. You're not, it, it, this is not a matter of, I have a bunch of volunteers, I have a bunch of uh, children. You're actually trying to create a match between the two. And I, I assume that some of the volunteers are much more interested in working with older older uh, young people, and some are very interested in in in, in the younger kids. Are there uh, is there a particular gap where the need is higher than the supply of people who are able to uh, provide it, but based on age or based on uh, particular attributes that that uh, a volunteer needs to have in order to That's, satisfy youth? There's one big one. Which is most of our volunteers are female, and half of our half of the ch um, children we serve are male. So we're not we haven't been very good at attracting men to work as um, CASA volunteers. So we haven't we haven't us us men have not necessarily stepped up, is what you're saying. Well, I don't know if that they haven't stepped up or if they just don't feel like it's something that they should be doing. I mean, I do feel like. Um, Kate, the same thing. At least in our culture, is considered very female. Right. So I think we need to figure out new ways of reaching men so that they realize, one, that they're really needed and that this is, it is caretaking, but it's so much more than that. Well, it's also, it's also very enhancing, right? I mean, the, the, the real question is, is how do you end up 
creating a voluntary environment in which not only um, the the children benefit, but also the volunteers understand the benefit that they, that they are receiving as well. It it needs to have be energetically correct in order to be sustainable, right? Absolutely. And I do think that one of the things about what we do, and I do think this entices lots of people to come volunteer, is that this isn't you come to a nonprofit and, I don't know, you stuff envelopes or paint a room or something. You know, you this is real, it's, you know, you do real stuff with real people. You have a real impact. You can see what's happening. And I think that is what, you know, entices people to come in and, you know, roll up their sleeves and really get to work in helping these young people. So let's not let's not paint this as too optimistic, too white or too dark. So there are situations that fail, right? There are uh, in there are um, uh, volunteers might come in with all the energy in the world. Uh, kids might come in with a positive attitude, but there are situations that do not work. Let's mm-hmm. talk a bit about that, and then let's also talk about what happens in the transition to independence and how that actually functions when it's successful. So let's talk about the former case. What happens when things become difficult? How do you deal with that? How do you, first of all, get the intelligence that um, that things aren't working out? Well, it can come from two two ways. Either the, ch- the child, well, usually it's, it's a teenager who will call us and say, listen, I don't really click with my CASA volunteer. I either don't want one or I don't want this one. In which case, we just switch. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, if they don't want one, that's fine. They don't have to have a CASA volunteer. But if they want a new one, we will give them a new, you know, we'll talk to them quite a long time about what's going on and what don't they like. Right. And so other times, though, it comes from the CASA volunteer who's like, I don't think we're clicking. You know, I don't think that this child really enjoy spending time with me. I'm not really sure that I'm helping them. Um, in which case we will look into it and investigate and talk to the child as well. And we will take people off of cases if we don't think it's a good match. Um, the other about how somebody, okay, well, first of all, to be able to successfully transition into adulthood, There's two points in California. One is when you're 18. Now, you can decide when you're 18 that you just don't want to be in the foster care system anymore, Um, that you just you want to be out of the system. You just many times people are just sick of it because if you stay in the foster care system, you still have to go to court every six months. You have to abide by some rules and some young people don't want to. Um, in those cases, one the first thing we have to make sure is that they are that they have graduated from high school or have a GED. And then we t- you know we talk to them a lot about you know what do they want to do next? Do you want job training? Do you want to go to college? Do you just want to get a job? And then we will help them do all of those things, including you know figuring out how to get an apartment, what that's going to cost, making sure they have a bank account. Well, by this time, this time, as as a, as a child is transitioning from child to youth to an adult to an adult status, at this point the relationship changes, right? I mean, the the casa volunteer who has been an advisor but also is is somewhat in 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 the persona of a type of parental figure like a parent needs to let go and needs to become more of an advisor more of a friend right yes absolutely absolutely and in fact you know if they leave foster once they leave foster care there is they're not a casa volunteer anymore right um, so if they stay in contact with the youth which actually most of them do um they're yeah, a friend. They have they have a they have a relationship, but it's a different type of a relationship. Right. It is. It's completely different. Do but it do doesn't so- mean they can't offer support because I mean young people, even you know, once they're legally adults, still need support. In fact, that's the biggest problem with foster former foster youth is they don't when something goes bad once they are uh, an adult, they have no one to fall back on. Right. And often these people can be the ones to say, they'll call them up 
and then they'll be like, oh, okay, let's, you know, figure this out. You know, what can we do here? You know, whatever it was that happened. So, but I do want to point out that the best scenario is for the youth to decide to stay in foster care. And there's a lot of research on California right now that shows that the longer you stay in foster care, the better your outcomes are going to be. So if they stay after they're over the age of 18, they can have, they would still have their CASA volunteer, but they're also given housing, a stipend. They do have to go to school or work for 20 hours a week, which there are exceptions to that, but it, which can be problematic if a child has, has, for example, really bad depression. But it's definitely, that's the best Okay, that's the best situation. But, and most, the overwhelming majority choose to do that, but it's not everybody. Well, let's wrap up with talking about this idea of, of trauma, depression, um, um, all these different factors. Um, you know, it seems to me sometimes that we talk about everything at the drop of the hat is trauma inducing. <laughs> Having to go to work is trauma-inducing. Growing up with a family is trauma-inducing, right? Growing up without a family is trauma-inducing. Going to school and getting educated in particular areas, trauma-inducing, right? Everything's trauma-inducing. But what we're talking about right now is basically a situation in which uh, the emotional impact is, is so high that it starts to affect your behavior. Right. Yes. I mean, this is what's going on. When we're talking about trauma, we're talking about something very specific that you carry that that thing from experience to experience to experience. And you bring so much baggage to the next experience that it actually affects how you function in life. Right. Yeah. Well, that actually really brings up a really good point, because what we found was that is a huge thing for foster youth. And actually, many of them are conscious of it and will even ask for help, in, you know, ask for therapy. And what a 2017 grand jury report found was that these kids were waiting a year or more to get any help. So we decided we had to do something about this because we could see that it was having such a huge impact that all these kids have been traumatized. Not like, you know, the way you were just talking about it, but real trauma that's impacting their functioning. So we developed and we realized that the problem is that there aren't enough therapists actually in the United States or in California. So we were like, well, it doesn't make sense to raise money and hire them because they're not there to be hired. So we developed a program where we recruit and train licensed therapists in California to provide teletherapy. This had nothing to do with the pandemic. It had to do with the fact that our kids move so often. It just happened to start. the therapy project, right? Yeah. It happened to start right before the pandemic, but that was just a coincidence. So you're training licensed therapists to uh, provide uh, in in the special needs that foster foster you have. Right. And for as long as they want, it's free. They can come and go, like if they, you know, want to deal with a particular issue for four months and then leave and then come back two months later, they can. Um, it's the same therapist. They always get, you know, are working with it so they don't have to retell their story a million times to a million different therapists, which is what was happening previously when they could get help. So, and this is for youth who are functioning fairly well, but know that they need help. It's completely voluntary. And um, it's been incredibly successful. Well, so very important. We're basically trying to reconstruct the, the glue of a village, the civil society glue of a village, um, and trying to deal with the fact that in our uh, massive environments that we have in modern society, that people can be traumatized by systems of care and creating that consciousness and the empowerment that uh, foster youth have, the vocabulary that they might have in order to provide for their own care is so very important. And Rickson, thank you so much for sharing the experience of CASA of Contra Costa County. Thank you for your service as executive director. And thank, please thank your volunteers, your staff, 
your board and your donors for the great work that they're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.